Well, this video is inspired uh, by events uh, that occurred at Porkfest, but is uh, an issue that certainly extends far beyond Porkfest, and I think uh, is pretty evident for anyone who follows the Liberty Movement uh, very closely, and that is a um, divergence in what it means to be libertarian. Um, on the one hand, there seems to be uh, a strong belief that libertarianism uh, is either defined by or requires uh, a certain social outlook um, in terms of what is generally called the culture war. So uh, a libertarian should be uh, to be a pejorative libertine, or at the very least, they should be uh, pro, um, say, gay marriage, they should be pro-homosexual, they should be, um, you know, for drug use, and, uh, you know, the, the, being libertarian means you're for all those things. And you don't have to be for those things, but you should be, and that's the libertarian ideal. Um, but in terms of culture war, uh, believing believing in you know gay rights or women's rights or whatever, that's not uh, not only is that not a necessary uh, condition for libertarianism by itself, it's an insufficient uh, pillar to be a libertarian because the uh, most important defining characteristic of a libertarian is where they believe uh, force is justifiably used in society, namely only in self-defense and never anywhere else. And their position on what other people should behave is totally irrelevant when it comes to this. Now, uh, if they believe in using force or aggression to uh, enforce some kind of, let us say, socially conservative uh, personal behavior norms, then they are not libertarian. The reason they are not libertarian is not because they go to church on Sunday and because they're against gay marriage. The reason they are not libertarian is because they favor the use of aggression to non-defensive self and outside the realm of non-defensive uh, self-defense. Likewise, people who uh, believe in gay rights and uh, whatever sexual freedom and promiscuity and drug use and all that sort of thing, if they believe in the use of the state for anything really, but if they but they believe in the use of coercion within society uh, for for something other than self defense, then they are not libertarian despite their tolerance. And this has kind of come up in a debate between the likes of Nick, Nick Gillespie and Reason, who kind of epitomizes, and when they talk about libertarianism, focus on uh, uh, the socially liberal uh, kind of interpretation of it to the exclusion of the non-aggression principle. Uh, and David Gordon, I think, uh, I'm definitely declaring for his interpretation of, of what it means and uh, you know, basically, that it, it's it's centered on the the non-aggression principle on the NAP, and that that other stuff is just it, it's it's different from libertarianism. Uh, you can be a consistent libertarian um, libertarian and be libertine and be socially progressive, and you can be libertarian and be socially conservative. And I saw this at Porkfest because there were a lot of people there who, quite frankly, weren't libertarians, but they were drug users, drug addicts in some cases, uh, socially very liber libertine, uh, and uh, this really kind of came to the full, to the head. I watched a recording of the uh, a show on Liberty Radio Network. I think it's called Prometheus Unbound. It's it's put out by Dale Everett and uh, I forget the other guy's name. Cute guy, whatever his name was. Um, I think it's called Prometheus Unbound bound or flaming liberty something like that it's basically a gay free state free staters show and they had a number of guests on who were basically um, people there for the porcupine freedom festival and one of them uh, who was coming in from Virginia was very explicit that uh, the nap was 
you know, what he believed in, which was great. And I'd say most of the people at Porkfest would agree with that. However, they had uh, one one person who had, who said that he worked for the DNC raising money, that he liked the DNC because of gay marriage, and that he had a lust for power and that he hated Republicans. Of course, that's all fine, but uh, there was no mention whatsoever of him believing in the NAP. And later they had a trans transgender uh, forgive me, I'm not sure what pronoun to use. Uh, they, I guess, she, I want to say she, because she was a girl, as far as I'm concerned, but she said she prefers to be known by male pronouns. So, I guess she is a he, by her own definition. I don't know about mine. Uh, I certainly wasn't attracted to her, so I don't think she was a guy. <laughs> That's a reasonable basis. And it was interesting because Dale basically tried to get her to say that she was a libertarian. She says, oh yeah, I believe you should be free to do all, all that stuff, meaning, you know, uh, do drugs and, you know, have your sexual identity. And I, and I think Dale is a good libertarian. I'm not questioning him, but I think that there was kind of a, a desire to make the term as much of an umbrella as possible. I think, I don't know, to, to make it look like there's more, or I don't know. I mean, I, I, there, people who argue, this isn't just for libertarianism, tend to sometimes have this tendency to to say if we can get someone to admit that they're to, to just self-describe as whatever it is I self-describe is that uh, that's worth worth something and it's it's really not um, I'm not a Nazi when it comes to uh, vocabulary or how people want to talk to themselves or language so if, if there are Nick Gillespie, if Nick Nick Gillespie, for instance um, wants to call himself a libertarian, you know, I can't stop him, and he can, but he and I don't agree on the same things. Uh, yes, he's socially liberal, but if he wants to have, like, say, student vouchers provided by the government and a minimal state or whatever, then he's not following the NAP, and I, he, he and I have some major fundamental di uh, disagreements, and the fact that he's socially liberal is irrelevant in that discussion. Uh, I feel more akin with a hardcore right-wing conservative Christian who explicitly endorses the NAP than I do with uh, some trendy, trendy liberal who just wants government to trim down a bit. Uh, the latter, the former is a libertarian, the latter is not. Uh, what they want to call, whatever they want to call themselves being completely irrelevant. Uh, the changes I want to see in society are not going to be advanced by somebody who calls himself a libertarian but uh, is a statist. Oh, uh, and the interesting he, she, it, not to sound, not to have my derisive attitude become too apparent, um, was in sustainable, it was going to school for sustainable uh, environmentalism or something like that, which is going to be 99% uh, communists. I mean, like all the greens, are, they're all watermelons. Green on the outside, red on the inside. Um, she was there, she said, just because she'd never heard of the Free State Project. She was just kind of there for friends. And so there's no there's no need for anybody to try and get somebody like that to identify as a libertarian. And sad to say in, in the show, although I guess it didn't make sense in the context of the interview, there was no attempt to say, well, maybe you should examine your political philosophy a little bit more. Uh, but... You're not a libertarian, at least you don't agree with its most important tenet, the non-aggression principle, just because you're socially liberal. And I don't. I, I wish that um, more people would understand. Now, most people, I think, do. Uh, at least at Porkfest, I think most people do. But there is kind of this tendency to just say, live free and do whatever, and that's just not a sufficient thing. And I said... This is the other thing I didn't like about Porkfest is there were a lot of people who, is just as far as I can say, I can say, are just embarrassing druggies. I mean, they're they're pretty low functioning, best I can tell. They don't have any money. They don't have good or steady employment, uh, which is fine if you want if you don't want to have a job, whatever. But then they don't have some kind of entrepreneurial thing that they're doing to compensate for that. They're basically uh, living really shitty lives, uh, letting themselves go to shit, 
and uh, they can call themselves whatever they want, but I don't see them as being particularly effective at advancing any political ideology, let alone the one I want to see advanced. Uh, and they're terrible, terrible, this is just to be uh, strategic here, they're terrible um, at spreading the message. You don't want the people to spread your message to look like druggies, especially, I mean, and and you don't want them to be basically bums. And there's more than a few of those at Porkfest. And, uh, of course, they have a right to be bums, but then they're not an asset to me or to anybody else. Uh, in fact, they are somewhat of an anchor and a hindrance. And I'm not sure exactly why that's tolerated. Now, I don't mean that they should be kicked out or anything like that, but I, I just wish people would say something like, hey, get your act together. That That's what I'm talking I'm not talking about like literally um, imprisoning people or anything like that. That would be wrong. Like I said, people have a right to be unemployed or whatever, but it it just speaks very poorly. When I, when I, when you work at a job, you don't want your co-workers to be lazy and stupid. I know I hate that. But you know, I care a lot more about libertarianism than I do about my job. And so when I see a whole bunch of people who are, I don't know, basically losers, and then they will use libertarian rhetoric to just say, well, don't, don't fucking tread on me. I'm, you know, well, I'm not treading on you, but you're a loser and I'm not sure. And this, I'm sorry if this is coming across as vague or unspecific because uh, most people at Porkfest aren't like that. But I saw a lot of, I saw people like that and I talked to people like that. And I mean, come on, read a book, get a job. Earn, earn some money. You shouldn't have to bum and mooch off people all the time. I mean, I saw a guy who was actually going around bumming. He didn't have a, to get a plastic cup to get something to drink, like water. Because he, apparently, that was beyond his means to produce himself. Which is embarrassing. And the way, the way that he looked, not to be too judgmental, I mean... He just he just looked like a druggy loser, and an alcoholic probably. Oh, and there are fuck okay. And I don't, when I say drugs, I am including alcoholism here. All right, like people drink to have fun. I understand that, but I mean there are some gross ass, disgusting people walking around Porkfest who are just sloshed out of their minds. You know that's that's embarrassing. Like you have a right to do that, absolutely. But you know there's freedom of association and there's freedom of speech, and so I'm just gonna say it, like. Don't don't pretend you're some kind of activist for a community if you are like that. Because even if you want to fancy yourself that way, is you're doing more of a disservice than a service if that's how you comport yourself. So that kind of bugged me more than a little, I say. Uh, and it's weird because you have it. It really is like a a, a scale where you've got uh, extremes on both ends. You've got those types, and then you have the most high-functioning, you know, ubermensch on the other side. And I don't know how they balance. There's more than a few, but you've got people who are physically very fit, take obvious great care of their body, who are multi-skilled. You know, they know how to handle a gun very well. They know they have jobs. They have marketable, useful, socially useful skills. They're in shape. They're highly intelligent, and they're very well read. And there were, t and I mean, there's lots of people like that. There's people like that on YouTube. There are people like that at Porkfest. And then you have this other end of the spectrum. And I, I just feel like telling those people to shape up, and not to just be a bunch of losers. Because it's, I mean, it's bad for them, and it looks bad for the movement. Uh, and it certainly doesn't help the movement at all. So that that kind of bugged me. And I don't see the point in just saying, hey, I mean. It, to me, that's like the, the quintessential libertarian who's like, and the, the cliched anti-libertarian is going to be, yeah, he's just some druggie. When really, <laughs> like, libertarians should be like hardworking people who don't feel like they're entitled to anything. Because if you, if you felt you were entitled to other people's stuff, then you would be, uh, 
you'd be violating the NAP. And if you want to live by the NAP, if you want to uh, organize society along an understanding of the NAP, then you have to be able to support yourself. And when I see people who don't support themselves, not people who can't, I didn't see anybody who couldn't do that, people who don't, then, I mean, how can they really support the NAP? Um, let me just go a little bit um, into this. Uh, you know, why why do I support the, the NAP so much? Why is that so important? Uh, if you are Rothbardian and a lot of people at the Mises Institute, you support the NAP for uh, moral reasons. It's just wrong to kill. It's wrong to steal. And I believe all that to a point. However, I am not convinced of some metaphysically absolute thing called right and wrong or rights. I'm not. I wish I was, and I, I actually like, I think that it doesn't have to exist in some absolute form to be extremely useful and meaningful, but w I am still 100% for the NAP and living by it and advocating it, if not on those grounds, on consequentialist grounds. Um, if we don't live by the, mat the NAP, then uh, we cannot have net gain social utility exchanges. What do I mean by that? If two people make an exchange and they both agree, then we can say that there has been net social gain because person A and person B both benefited by their own standards, whatever those are, and they could be different. You could have a very avaristic person who believes that they gain because they got money out of the deal dealing with somebody else who doesn't value money quite so highly, but they feel that they gain because they got something else that they value more. Say a product that the first person created. Well, they both they both won. It was a win-win, good. And if every interaction that ever took place in society was such, then all we would see is a, a, a ever-increasing quantity of uh, wants, satisfaction. And everything would be great. And the, the NAP would be satisfied. But if you have bilateral, unilateral exchanges where one party doesn't agree and one party does, well, that's at best, that's neutral. Uh, when you're talking with a state, since the exchange is also very inefficient, it's net negative. I mean, we see, you know, taxation would be, well, okay, one party gains and one party doesn't. But the party that's gaining is then... Um, wasting most of the money in the absence of purpose. So they say we're being taxed for, say, education, but of the $100 they take a, take from me for education, only maybe 8 or $9 really goes towards education, and the rest of it is lost in bureaucratic fiction, friction. And so it's a net social loss. That's bad, and that arises from a, a departure from the NAP. So on, consequ on consequentialist grounds... Uh, the NAP is really important, even if the uh, morality of it is unproven or discounted. And that's why I'm so big on it. And I and this came up in a debate with Stefan Molyneux, and um, he wasn't debating Ben Powell. Ben Powell asked, and uh, Molyneux quite incorrectly blew off consequentialism. Look, if society is like a human body, and we just say we're going to ignore the NAP and do what we think is best for people and uh, you're, you're basically ignoring sensory input. If we say we're gonna make an exchange with you person to person and we don't care what you think about it we're just going to make it we're just going to tax you and pay what we think is for best for you in taxes um, then you are ignoring their assessment of the transaction and this is like if you ignore half of the cells in your body, in which case you could literally be shitting yourself to death and you wouldn't know it. And that's that's what we have uh, when we depart from the market, when we depart from free market capitalism. That's what we have. That's what socialism and central planning get us. Now, the more socialism and central planning you have, the farther away from the NAP you get the, the more sensory data or societal human knowledge you're ignoring, the worse it is. So uh, North Korea 
is it's still probably got like 15 20 percent market i know officially it'd be less than that but when we just factor in all the all the black markets and the gray markets and all the things that economists typically don't measure but are still market activities like i don't know parents taking the time to tuck in their kids that sort of thing um and so that society is terribly des destitute but it hasn't gone extinct soviet union you know who knows maybe 50 percent socialist 50% capitalists, obviously, uh, tens of millions of people died. The standard of living was uh, pretty much pathetic in comparison to contemporary Western societies. Uh, you look at all the Western states, they're majority capitalists. I mean, even now, the vast majority of the transactions within society are mutual. The vast majority, even with all the taxes and all the regulation. And so they do fairly well. Uh, the, the tendency has been for them to slowly ignore more and more of society uh, by uh, getting away from the NAP and that has caused their um, the re at the very least the retardation of their growth it has slowed their growth uh, in some places in some ways stopped and reversed that growth uh, certainly that's the case in the United States and so uh, that's why the NAP is so fucking important uh, how you, you know your sexual preferences and all that is is so secondary to the issue of when and where uh, violence is used in society, and so you can have the, just the most you know um, politically correct and and sexually open and you know hippie pot smoking whatever but if they believe in, in the government if they believe in taxes and if they believe in ignoring uh the value the individual value judgments of everyone within society to the um to the subjugation of their own personal preferences usually it's what the state wants but people like to imagine it's what they want although that's really literally never the case um, then they're not libertarian and what they're advocating sure it might be socially liberal or progressive or whatever but they're not advocating what I want they're not advocating what like Rothbard and everyone else all, all the great libertarians were looking for they're they're advocating something that's actually antagonistic to that it's the antithesis even if the veneer is of the same color um, and so there and and the other thing is you can believe in the nap and that doesn't mean you have to be sexually libertine you can say i think all gays are going to go to hell i don't think there should be gay marriage i think that any any church worth its salt would deny gays the right to come there i think that uh, businesses should be able to kick gays out and that renters should be able to not rent to gays and not serve gays you could say all those things and still be a principled libertarian then you can be against all those things and be the most, you know, new age uh, hippie in the world. But if you think that the government should have vouchers, have a military, have police, have a monopoly on law, then you are not a libertarian. You are a regressive statist. And uh, there's no real reason why actual libertarians should care what you call yourself, let alone advocate that you call yourself libertarian so uh, at pork fest this wasn't a huge issue uh, but it is within the libertarian movement where you've got a lot of these people in, i mean the cliched most famous example would be like Nick reason and, and i don't know about cato so much but definitely reason and definitely someone like nick, nick gillespie and i'm glad he's out there and he'll say things i agree with m most of the time but he's dead wrong when he thinks that libertarianism uh, just means being socially liberal it doesn't that's not a necessary condition and alone it's an insufficient one it, it's about violence in society and uh, everything else is really secondary to that so all right that is it I hope I didn't come across too hard but it just it <sighs> I guess it's a little bit of a disappointment because I expected to go there and just meet like on this curve you know I expected to meet only people at the top end of the curve I really did 
Like that's kind of what I was hope not what I was hoping for. That was just what I expected. That's just what I thought I would find. And those people were there. And then there was a bottom side of that curve. I didn't expect to see them there. I didn't expect people like that to even exist. Because I thought to be a libertarian, you had to put more intellectual effort into it than the people some of the people I saw there are apparently capable of doing. And that's not to say look, you can have long hair and a beard and you can have done it and you know then I've been fooled, but it was more than that, at least in several cases. So uh, I this is the perspective that you don't get listening to Free Talk Live uh, or watching Ian Freeman because as far as I can tell, there's very little kind of hey let's these people need to shape up, you know, or ship, well, I don't want to say or ship out, but I mean, they need to shape up, and somebody needs to tell them, apparently, I mean, maybe, maybe I'm wrong, I mean, maybe, maybe somebody has, but I, I just got this sense of, I'm just going to be a loser, and uh, fuck anyone who says anything about it, because that would be unlibertarian, well, it's not unlibertarian to say it, and, uh, I care too much about this that I'm not going to just allow it. So a couple of people have asked me about Austin Peterson. I will make a video about that. Um, I think the comments that he made are actually in a lot of ways more reflective of general trends than his own personality, which I don't have. I'm not citing any character flaws or anything with him personally. Just some of the things he said were pretty tr troubling. So I'll make another video about that, but I don't know when, but that's it.